Blessed Matters of Uganda by Monsignor Henri Stretcher, White Father, Monsignor Stensera, Apostolic Vicar of Uganda, 1897 to 1933. In 1897, the Holy See entrusted the newly founded Society of the White Fathers with the evangelization of the regions near lakes Nyanza and Tanganyika, a part of Central Africa as yet but little known. The missionaries reached Uganda in 1879, were welcomed by the King Mutesa, and soon gathered round them a circle of catechumens. Mutesa, however, grew suspicious of the movement, and towards the end of 1882 compelled the missionaries to leave the country. Two years later, his successor Mwanga recalled them, but his goodwill too was of short duration. In less than a year after their recall, the Christians were subjected to persecution and many endured horrible tortures with horrific fortitude. During his father's lifetime, Mwanga seemed inclined to become a Christian, but once king, he decided that he could not be expected to submit to the Ten Commandments, and he remained a pagan. His hatred of Christianity was inspired by the staunch refusal of his Christian pages to submit to his sinful suggestions. This is clear from the canonical evidence presented for the cause of beatification, upon which this account is based, and Pope Benedict the Fifteenth called them not only valiant confessors of the faith, but also matters of chastity. Joseph Mukasa grew up at the court of King Mutesa, where his integrity and devoted loyalty made him a trusted favorite of his royal master. It was in his arms that Mutesa died in 1884, when Joseph was 24 years of age. He had been baptized in 1882 and was the foremost member of the Christian community. Mwanga made him the major domo of his own household and his office gave him authority over the 500 pages of whom Charles Luanga was the immediate head. The other courtiers expected to see Joseph become Katikiro, that's the chief minister, and openly said so. In consequence, he was hated as a possible rival by the existing Katikiro. The king was soon to hate him too, for Joseph dared to reproach the king for his debauchery, and he protected the Christian pages against his evil desires. Knowing all this, Mwanga's advisers, all pagans or Muslims, hinted to him that he was no longer king in his own country, for they said, A real king does as he likes. There is a new king of Uganda, the god of the Christians, whom alone the pages obey at the word of Joseph Mukasa and the white priests. Mwanga determined to banish this god, and the first step would be to get rid of Joseph Mukasa. An opportunity was soon forthcoming. Father Lourdel used to treat the king for his minor ailments, and one day he was brought by Joseph Mukasa to attend to the king's sore eyes. The priest prescribed also some sleeping pills, which were administered by Joseph and caused the king some gastric trouble. Mwanga flew into a rage And calling the Katikiro, he accused Joseph, who disobeys me and sets my subjects against me, of trying to poison him. The Katikiro, delighted at this chance of harming his rival, piled up further accusations against him and added, Give me this Joseph, I will rid you of him. Take him away, replied Mwanga. You will save my life by doing this. There shall no longer be two kings in Uganda. Joseph, who had received Holy Communion that very night, was arrested and without trial condemned to be burned alive before sunrise. When the executioners tried to bind his hands, he protested, I'm about to die for my faith. Am I likely to fear death? Tell Mwanga that he has condemned me unjustly, but I forgive him with all my heart. Tell him too that I advise him to repent, for unless he does so, he will have to answer for me before the tribunal of God. So saying, he walked to the place of execution. 
Even Mukajanga, the chief executioner, respected Joseph, and he showed him favor by cutting off his head before placing him in the stake. It was Sunday, the 15th of November, 1885. The death of Joseph Mukasa, far from discouraging or even intimidating the Christians as Mwanga expected, only moved them to pray that they too might die for the faith. Prudence, however, obliged them to take some measures for their own safety. The paths leading to the mission were guarded by the king's spies, but at night the neophytes and catechumens would creep through the plantation and go to the priest's house. The missionaries taught them the catechism and sometimes baptized or confirmed them. And while waiting for midnight when mass was said and holy, holy communion given, they spoke to them about God, about the passion of our Lord, the sorrows of Our Lady, the sufferings of the martyrs, the vanity of all earthly possessions, and the joys of heaven. At the time, the Christian community had about 200 members, and two of the neophytes deserve special mention, Andrew Kagwa and Charles Luanga. Andrew Kagwa was the chief of Chigowa and was liked by everyone. About 30 years of age, the king who called him friend intended to make him general-in-chief of his army. But it was known that Andrew had converted his wife and gathered about him a hundred and fifty catechumens, including two of the Katikiro's children. This was an unpardonable offense, and the Katikiro only awaited a suitable moment for vengeance. Charles Longa had been baptized on the night following Joseph Mukasa's execution, when he had been four years a catechumen. Although only 20 years of age, he was the head of the 500 pages in the service of the royal family, and his position exposed him to the attacks of Mwanga, who told him that he would exterminate all the Christians. He also sent him to the missionaries with a message to the effect that unless the priests ceased to teach religion, the mission would be sacked and they themselves banished from Uganda. On other occasions, he would don sheep's clothing. My son, you seem to have lost your affection for me. Why is it? Well, go on praying if you must, but pray in your heart and keep away from those cursed priests. Day by day, Charles had to endure any reproaches or feigned caresses that were more dangerous than threats, and this situation was rendered all the more difficult by the necessity of protecting the Christian pages from their master. The youngest of these was a boy of 13 years of age, a son of Chimbugwe, the highest official in the kingdom after the Katikiro. This boy, Chizito, was a catechumen, and his good looks were a special danger to his virtue, but Chizito had a horror of sin. Every time the king sent for him, he fled to Charles Luanga for protection. Luanga would hide him or send him out on an errand or invent an imaginary illness, well knowing that he risked his life in doing so. Chizito fully anticipated that one day he would have to choose between a life of shame and a painful death. He dreaded it, for he had not yet received the grace of baptism, and was afraid that he might yield to temptation. But the missionaries continually postponed his reception of the sacrament. He used to confide his fears to Charles Luanga, who told him, Be afraid of nothing. I shall always stand by you. When the time comes for you to confess your faith, you shall hold my hand, and we will die together. The subterfuges invented by Luanga to protect the pages did not escape the notice of the tyrant, and he was only kept from violent action by the reflection that Charles' death would not terrify the Christians any more than that of Mukasa had done. Since all the Christian pages persisted in their antagonism towards himself, he would kill the lot, and Charles then would have the foremost place in the massacre. In the meantime, Mwanga persecuted the Christian pages, inflicting punishment out of all proportion to their peccadillos. A young catechumen, Mukasa Chiriwawamvu, was placed in the death house for a quarrel with a companion 
and a neophyte Pontian Ngondwe was bound in chains for giving an incorrect message. Both were to die a few days later for their faith. Only a spark was needed to kindle the conflagration. On the night of the Thursday, the 25th of May 1886, the king called for a page named Mwafu, a boy of 14, a catechumen and the son of the katikiro. He was slow in coming, and the king asked him, Where do you come from? From the house of Chisule the Amara. What were you doing there? Denis Sebuguao was teaching me the catechism. The catechism? thundered Mwanga and called for Dennis. What were you doing just now with Mwafu? Teaching him religious doctrine. What? shouted Mwanga. You miserable slave! You are teaching religion when I have forbidden it, and you dared to teach it to the Katikiro's own son? Snatching a lance from a servant, Mwanga thrust it into Dennis's throat. He was on the point of stabbing Mwafu in the same way, but he refrained because the boy's father was, after all, the Katikiro. He ordered a Muslim bystander to take Dennis away and give him the coup de grace. With the help of some others, he stabbed the boy to death with a butcher's knife. Still in a terrible rage, Mwanga set out for the house of Andrew Kagwa. On his way, he met another Catholic, Honorat Nyonyintono, which means little bird, and ordered him to be killed. At Andrew's house, he found only one neophyte, James Buzabaliao, whom he had arrested. That night, Mwanga told the Katikiro that he would put to death every single Christian. The gates of the king's enclosure were closed, orders given to allow no one to pass out, and a chain of fires was lit so that the guards could see clearly along every yard of the mile-long enclosure. Realizing that it might be the last night of their lives, Charles Luanga baptized the four most advanced catechumens at the court, Chizito, Mbaga Tuzinde, Javira, and Mugagga. They all kept vigil through the night and prepared by prayer for their promotion to the ranks of the martyrs of Christ. Next day, Friday the 26th of May, the king's council met in his house at 8 o'clock in the morning. Mwanga began with a bitter complaint. It was your duty to find me faithful servants, but you have given me nothing but traitors. At these words, the whole assembly trembled, and each member thought anxiously. Was it to strangle me that Mwanga brought me here so early? Then one spoke up. Master, our sons were obedient when we placed them in your service. If they have become traitors, it is because they have been bewitched. Kill those you have now, and we will bring you others whom you can trust. Then a chorus of voices was heard. Yes, kill them, kill them, we will replace them with others. Mwanga feigned pity. But these lads are your sons. How can I kill your sons? But they cried out, If they are traitors, they are no longer our sons. We disown them, kill them, and we'll give you others who will serve you better. The king was delighted to have obtained such ready consent to his plans and gave Charles Luanga orders to summon all the pages. To them Wanga shouted, Let all who do not pray remain here by my side, and let those who pray cross over to yonder palisade. Charles Luanga was the first to step forward. Little Chizito took his hand as they had planned, and they crossed over together. All the other neophytes followed his example. The group was composed of young men all under the age of 25. Mwanga glared at them and yelled, So it is true that you are Christians? Yes, master, we are Christians. Do you intend to remain Christians? 
yes, until death. Then the tyrant turned to the executioners, crying, Put them to death! To the neophytes he addressed a parting insult, Be off and eat your cow in your father's house. The executioners bound the condemned pages with ropes round their necks and wrists. But Mukajanga, their cruel chief, was moved with pity for his own son Mbaga, a boy hardly fifteen years of age, was amongst the condemned. He stole up to him and said imploringly, Say that you will give up praying, then your life will be safe. No, father, said the boy, I cannot say that, for I do pray and shall do so for as long as I live. Then run and hide in my house. No, indeed, I shall not run away. I intend to die with my friends. Mukajanga longed to save the boy's life and asked his assistant, Sevata, to use his powers of persuasion. Sevata had no better success. Get away, answered the boy. You have nothing to do with me. You are not my father. And then he sought to escape temptation by exclaiming to his fellow prisoners, Come, let's go. What are you all waiting for? Mwanga was denied the gratification of hearing his victims' lamentations. For these boys carried their heads high and their eyes shone with joy. It was an unprecedented sight that filled the heathen with amazement. Father Lourdel, the superior of the mission, was standing in the adjoining courtyard, for when he heard what was taking place, he had rushed to the palace to help them, if possible. He said later, the heroic little band passed within a few feet of me, the young men had been bound together, and the boys formed a second group. They were tied so closely together that they could scarcely walk, and saw little Chizito laughing merrily at this, as if it were a game. While they were on their way, a young soldier named James Wu Zavaliao was brought before the king. He had given religious instruction to children in the town, and Mwanga accused him of even trying to convert him. He said to the lad, You are the chief of the Christians here? I am a Christian, replied James, it is true, but the title of chief does not belong to me. This is the man, continued the king, who actually wanted me to adopt his religion. Take him away and cut off his head at once. I mean to begin with him. Farewell then, the young Christian said, I am going to paradise and I will pray to God for you. This provoked a shout of laughter from the pagan bystanders and they said, These Christians must have lost their senses to talk in this way. Father Lourdel did all he could to save the boys. I told the king the harm he was doing to himself by putting to death his best servants. But the king only laughed. I will not allow my servants to pray. I am the king. Everyone cannot say that. I am master here, and no one shall resist my authority. And then he went on, But I shall not kill them all, I will spare a few. And that was all that Father Lourdel could gain. Then Andrew Kagwa, the king's friend, was arrested. He had received Holy Communion the night before, and had in fact been present in court early that morning. Mwanga knew that, but pretended ignorance of it. The chief minister reminded him of it. You are going to kill our sons and spare that worthless Munyoro? That is, a native of Munyoro, which was a neighboring country. You will spill pure Muganda blood and let a car go unharmed? When you kill an animal, must you not strike its head? Will you allow this fellow to go on inciting our people to rebellion? Hand him over to me and let me deal with him. Mwanga could find no answer, and so he left his boyhood friend to the mercy of the Katikiro who asked Andrew, Are you then the man who dared to instruct my sons in the doctrine of your religion? 
Yes, I did do so. Why do you invite people to pray at your house? And why do you help to spread this religion all over Uganda? If I pray or teach, it concerns myself alone. That was enough, and the wicked man sentenced Andrew to death. Then, because he knew that Mwanga might on second thoughts reprieve this friend of his, he ordered Andrew's immediate execution. I shall not taste food until I see his severed arm before my eyes. But the executioners could not believe that the king would approve the death of his great friend, and they hesitated. Whereupon Andrew said to them, Your master is hungry. Did you not hear him say so? If he asked you to bring him a fatted kid, would you not hasten to kill it? Set before him then the only food that will give him an appetite. Do not keep him waiting. Put me to death. An eyewitness said, I saw Andrew Kagwali of the tribunal. His step was brisk and his face shone with joy. The procession disappeared behind a reed palisade and I remained in the courtyard. In less than ten minutes, one of the executioners appeared, holding a man's arm severed at the shoulder, which he had slung on a rope, and whence the blood was flowing freely. He took it to the katikiro in the judgment hall. The katikiro could now dine. The executioners cut off their victim's head and burned his body. It was Friday the 26th of May 1886 at two o'clock in the afternoon when Charles Luanga and his companions were marching to Kampala on their way to the stake. In Uganda, death sentences were carried out without much delay, and Mukajanga, having decided that Namugongo should be the place of the execution, a start was made on that very day on the 37-mile walk. A halt was made at Kampala about halfway. But before setting out, Mukajanga sent for the Christians whose imprisonment had already been prescribed. Are you a Christian? he asked Ponchlan. Yes, I'm a Christian. Is that the truth? Certainly it is. I am a Christian. For reply, Mukajanga transfixed him with the lance. This dog has very soft flesh, he said. My lance goes through it like butter. Ponson was afterwards decapitated and his head lay on the roadside all day. The convoy had scarcely started when God sent them a great consolation. Two executioners emerged from a plantation leading a young man by rope. His name was Mukasa Chiriwawamvu, the catechumen thrown into prison two weeks before after a brawl with his comrade Javira. A halt was made and Mukajanga addressed the new arrival. The king orders you to share the fate of these criminals because you practice the same religion. Thank you, thank you, cried Mukasa, raising his hands to heaven. My prayer is answered. Then rushing to meet the prisoner, he exclaimed, I was afraid that I should be forgotten in prison and that you should go without me. Javira, with whom he had quarreled, greeted him with a smile. I am glad to see you, Mukasa, he said, and glad that we shall die together. And I am glad to die with you. The march continued under the scourging sun, and two hours later they passed the plantation belonging to Bruno's brother. Their thirst was intense, and Bruno called to his brother to bring some banana wine. But Bruno did not take it. He gave his brother a long look that seemed to say, when our Lord was dying on the cross, he refused to drink. I will not drink either. At six o'clock in the evening, the column arrived at Kampala to spend the night. Every prisoner was fastened by his wrists and ankles to a heavy block of wood, and his neck was placed on a wooden fork, the points of which were driven into the ground. Athanasius protested at this treatment. We are being killed for the king's food. Our master is hungry. Why keep him waiting while we parade along the road to Namugongo? Kill me here. It was the custom of the executioners to leave a corpse here and there along the road leading to the place of execution, and they readily agreed to Athanasius' proposal, 
and at the very spot where Joseph Mukasa had been tortured six months before, they stabbed him with lances. Then, greedy for blood, they cut his body to pieces. Next morning, 27th May, when the captives were released from their instruments of torture, their faces were stiff and their feet terribly swollen. Gonzaga Gonza had suffered more than the others. His feet were bleeding, and a raw wound encircled his ankles. He tried to keep up with the others, but soon fell to the ground. He raised his neck with a glance at the executioners. They understood and cut off his head. Our blessed martyrs arrived at Namugongo that evening and learned from the executioners how Andrew Kagwa had been killed and Atanalias at Kampala and Gonza Gagonza at Luboa. Their eyes shone with pride and Charles Luanga said to the pagan bystanders, You do not understand our religion. If you did, you too would long to die for the faith. The executioners now released Litombaga and handed him over to a relative. Some of the pagans said, He will be set free for his Mukajanga's son. But Charles Luanga said, Mpuambaga, let us pray that he might not yield to temptation. The other prisoners were confined in Kangs. There they would remain for seven long days before walking to the stake a few hundred yards away. On 3rd June Ascension Day, about a hundred executioners gathered round Mukajanga's hut. Their faces were daubed with red clay and soot, cluster of feathers waved from their heads, and amulets hung from their necks. Bundles of bells attached to their heels completed the terrifying equipment and rattled noisily as they danced round the rage fire. They had spent the night drinking and dancing, and now sang the war song of which the chorus ran. The women that bore them will weep today. Yes, today they will weep. The athletes of our Lord came forward with ropes round their necks, and their hands tied behind them. Wasted and weakened by pain and hunger, they still maintained their erect bearing and calm, happy expression. They had been in solitary confinement and now rejoiced at seeing each other again. This joy became triumph when they saw Mbaga run to join them. Well done, Mbaga, they cried out. You have done honor to the Christian name. But the pagans said, just listen to the young fools. You would think they were going to a wedding. They want to make merry, do they? We will give them something to be merry about. The prisoners walked in single file before Senkole, the assistant chief executioner, and according to the superstitious custom, he tapped each on the head lightly with a rod so that his spirit would not enter into the king. But the rod did not fall on the three of them, Dennis Kamuka, Simon Sevuta, and Charles Werabe, who were to be spared. It was also the custom for the executioner to reserve a prisoner to himself, and as Charles Luanga passed, Senkole said, I reserve thee to myself. Charles cried out to the others, Goodbye, I am to stay here. We shall meet in an hour in paradise. Forty paces on, the confessors faced the pyre, and one of them said, this is where we shall see God. According to custom, a few drops of banana juice were offered to each prisoner. The ropes were tightened and reed mats were wrapped around each separately. They were carried to the stake while the executioners mocked them as our Lord was mocked on the cross. You are to be roasted. Now we shall see if the God in whom you trust will come and deliver you. The answer came from Bruno. You can burn our bodies, but our souls you cannot touch. They will go to paradise. The three pages who were pardoned showed so much distress that the executioners humored them by wrapping them in reed mats and promised to burn them after the others. Mukajanga made another vain attempt to get his son to renounce his faith. The king told you to kill me. Please do so, said the boy. 
Mukajanga then told another to kill him with a club before putting him in the fire. Soon the fire was blazing, and the executioner's knives in hand chanted the war song. It is not we who are killing you, it is the gods who are revenging themselves for your scorn of them. When the holocaust was complete, the three pages who had been spared were released and sent back to the court. On their way they saw a smoking mass of cinders, amongst which were the remains of Charles Luanga, whom Senkoli had reserved for himself. Charles was burned over a slow fire. His feet were cinders before the flames had touched the upper part of his body. Come, said Senkole, call upon your God and let us see if he can save you from the fire. Poor madman, the matter replied. You know not what you say. It seems to me that you are pouring cool water over my feet. Take heed to yourself lest the God you offend should commit you to the worst of all fires that which will never die out. No murmur passed from his lips. Matthias Mulumba had for a long time been the object of special aversion to the enemies of God. He was the chief of Chirumba, a remote corner of Uganda which had but a handful of Christians. Its catechumens, however, numbered over 200. Matthias was the life and soul of the little community. He gained most of the recruits and afterwards became their catechist, father and protector. After Matthias, the most noteworthy neophytes were Luke Vanava Chintu and Noah Mawagali. All three were destined to be martyrs. As soon as the persecution broke out, Matthias and Luke were arrested and taken before the chief minister and trial did not last five minutes. What? Murumba, you have become a Christian at your age? Yes, I have. Why do you pray? Because I wish to do so. Who cooks your food now that you have sent away your wives? Is it because I am thin or on account of my religion that you have summoned me before this tribunal? You dare to question me? Take him away and kill him at once. That is just what I wish for, said Matthias. Executioner, resumed the Katikiro. Cut off his hands and feet and tear strips of flesh off his back and broil them in his sight and no doubt his God will deliver him. Then turning to Luke, he asked, Do you pray? Yes. Is that true? Perfectly true. Let him be killed with the others at Namugongo. On arrival at Kampala, Matthias sat down and said to the executioner that he had no hope of reprieve if they should kill him at once. Mukajanga ex exclaimed, So he refuses to go any further? Very well, cut off his arms and legs. And so it was done. His arms were severed first at the wrists and then at the elbows. His legs were cut off at the knees. The executioners themselves described the horrible scene and asserted that while they sawed through his bones, Matthias did not utter a single cry. He merely murmured, My God! My God! They said they tore long strips of flesh from his breast and shoulders and burned them before his eyes. To prolong his agony, they tied his arteries and veins. Three days later, a man who was passing by had a cry for water. It was Matthias, echoing the cry from the cross, I thirst. The man drew near, but fled in horror from what he saw. Matthias, distinguished alike by the austerity and innocence of his life and the atrocity of his sufferings, is perhaps the finest flower in Uganda's crown of martyrs. The men who had arrested Matthias and Luke also carried off Matthias' wife and child and arrested Noah in Luke's hut later. Noah stepped to the door and fell transfixed by a lance. Luke went on to Namugongo and shared the fortunes of the pages last. 
The missionaries had forbidden their little flock to deliver themselves voluntarily into the hands of the executioners, otherwise few would have escaped. Among those who did was a man of about thirty years of age, named Jean-Marie Musei. He had been a page of Mutesa's, and was so wise that they called him Musei, the old one. He could not tear himself away from the priests, and with three friends he hid himself near the mission. This was discovered, and Mwanga laid a trap for him with the connivance of the Katikiro, who sent Lamari a message to the effect that in consideration to his services to Mwanga's father Mutesa, he would be welcome at court and would be rewarded with a plantation and chiefdom. The friends suspected a trap. But Lamari said, We cannot go on indefinitely hiding like this. Let me go. If the king kills me, I can meet no better fate, for I shall die for my faith. He went to the palace and saw the katikiro and king who told him to return and bring his friends to receive the plantations promised them. Lamari returned to his friends but went back alone again to the court. This happened a second time when he was thrown into a muddy pool outside the Katikiro's house. The name of the blessed Lamari Musei closes the list of the 22 martyrs. Poor King Mwanga, who thought to drown the baby church of Uganda in its own blood, was merely watering the seed of Christians. There are now five Catholic bishops in Uganda, and one of them is a Muganda who has more than a hundred Baganda priests, while Uganda nuns are spread in their hundreds all over the country. Paganism is in its death throes, and yet it is but seventy years since the fires died out at Namugongo over the ashes of the blessed martyrs of Uganda.